space, which is the ultimate space to get to talk about Moran Frame, because we can all look at it as we're talking. And especially given the weather this summer, um, doing this kind of meeting outside, I just couldn't stomach it. So thank you, <laughs> Owen, and to the rest of the Sailing Center staff um, for having us here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Samantha Dunn. I work in the Community and Ec Economic Development Office. Some people know it as CEDO. Um, at the city of Burlington, and I'm here um, with several of my colleagues from the Burlington Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront Department. This is a collaborative effort, obviously, um, because this is a park, um, and with Zach Campbell of Friends of Frame. Um, hopefully you all know about Friends of Frame, but if you didn't before, you'll find out about it tonight. So um, we're here tonight to um, kind of kick off a second phase of um, design and, and really to talk first about how we're thinking about the site right now, some ideas that we have um, for what should happen in phase two, and then mostly to hear your ideas, questions, and thoughts so that we can make sure that, that all of your thinking is incorporated um, into, into how we're thinking about the second phase. Um, in addition to the three um, project partners that you see up here on the screen, I just want to call out a few other partners that we've had at the frame, and they'll have a chance um, at the end of this presentation um, to talk about what they're doing. But we've got Vermont Skate Society, um, Joy Riders, Skate Club, and I always you have three different organizations. Heart Song. Heart Song. Heart here, song here. if anyone's gotten to be in a hammock um, in the frame, that's Heart Song, Lauren. So they're going to have a chance to talk about how they've been using um, the frame this summer as well. I want to welcome Mayor Weinberger. I don't know if you want to say anything. This is an unplanned attendance. <laughs> I'm just excited to uh, be here and then we'll, we'll kick it off uh, the second day. I'm excited to hear what uh, those thoughts are. Um, and I've been a great team. People start to enjoy the frame this summer. And I'm eager to see where we can go with the next. Um, so tonight we're going to do a quick overview. Again, some people are, been, are very familiar with the history of the project. Some people don't know anything about it. So we'll do a quick overview kind of how we've gotten here, hear a little bit about the current events, what was happening at the frame over the summer since we cut the ribbon last November, um, and then an overview of how we're thinking about phase two and kind of um, our design team will be doing a virtual site walk to, again, talk about how we've been thinking about the site, they've been thinking about the site, and getting your input um, throughout. So there'll be a couple of opportunities during this presentation um, where there'll be questions, like make sure we have a chance to hear from people about specific things being presented. Um, but then at the end, a much more general opportunity to share ideas, questions, and thoughts. OK, so the history a brief history of a long um, standing project. You can go to the next slide. Um, the Moran plant was uh, arrived here in the 1950s as an electric uh, coal powered uh, generating plant to po uh, provide power to the city of Burlington. In the 70s, it was converted to wood chips on our early um, progress towards a more sustainable power production. Um, and then in the 80s, this plant was shut down and when the McNeil generating plant came online, um, where all of our power is now um, provided without fossil fuels. There was then a long uh, period, about three decades, where the building um, that was the Moran plant just sat there. And there were lots of ideas about what could and should happen on the waterfront. Um, none of them came to fruition. I think this is um, often the case. Sometimes it's better when things can't happen right away and uh, communities have time to like think about how a place you know, could be preserved or evolved. And so um, the city City of Burlington has made a huge um, long-term investment in maintaining public access to the waterfront. And, and us not um, moving forward with any of the early ideas at the Moran Frame has really allowed that us to continue and have this very, very long stretch um, of publicly accessible waterfront, which is when you live in Burlington, you think like, of course, but it's actually quite unusual. So I like to think about this three decade period as something that really has served the city well um, to make sure that, that we've arrived at 
this um, place of public access to the waterfront. Um, in about 2015, so almost 10 years ago, I'm gonna just get this right, it was the, I always know it as the PAP. Mara, what's the PAP? Public Investment Action Plan. Thank you, Public Investment Action Plan. <laughs> this is the good, I know. Oh, right there. Public Investment Action Plan kind of um, reiterated that vision for public access on the waterfront and was kind of like, city, we need to figure out what we're doing. This was a, the, the Moran plant was a derelict site. Like, you've got to, we got to figure it out so that we can open up the northern waterfront um, to the public. And um, following that, there was many people remember the new, the nonprofit New Moran um, had a lot of momentum for redeveloping um, for a, lots of different reasons. I think mostly financial that fell apart. And it was really in order to move forward with the other components of this public investment action plan, something had to be done at Moran. Um, and to, in a sort of last ditch effort for um, folks who love this um, architecture, this idea of the frame came out as an instead of just demolishing the whole thing and having a blank slate. Um, so that's how we arrived here. That was pretty um, universally accepted. And demolition on the plant uh, started in 2020 and wrapped up two years later um, when I was uh, lucky enough to um, inherit this project. Um, so again, we cut the ribbon um, last November. We've had activations this summer and are now looking forward to the second phase um, of design at the site. For people who want to know way more about the history of this site, we have this amazing resource that was part of the um, frame project that's now available on the CETO website um, that is hundreds of pages documenting the history of what has happened on this site. Um, as I said, we cut the ribbon um, on the project in last November. We were trying to get it open for last summer. As everyone knows, construction costs and things, it was November. And so that gave us a little bit more time to plan and be ready to activate the site um, this summer. And as I was mentioning with the PF, the, the cutting of the ribbon on the Moran frame was really the last piece of this reimagining of the northern waterfront um, that everyone knows of that starts to the north here where we are with the sailing center, the skate park, which is an amazing uh, resource right outside the window, the Moran Frame Waterworks Park just to the west, the fishing pier, and Burlington Harbor Marina. So the first phase um, was really about stabilizing the site and preserving this um, structure and creating safe access. There was environmental remediation that had to happen both uh, around the building and around the site. So it was really about getting um, safe public access to this location and to lay the framework for what was gonna come next. So this phase that we're embarking on. And we're thinking about this phase as trying to take the frame from something safe to something spectacular. Um, when I inherited the project, the, the first phase was phase 1A. Like there had always been, we knew that we were just starting on this adventure. I've moved past 1B to phase 2. Um, and, and the goals of this phase are really about improving accessibility, making this a place that is welcoming and comfortable um, for all of our public and our um, visitors to the city of Burlington, making sure it's connected with our entire waterfront and taking advantage of sort of the iconic opportunity that we have here that has already begun to like really inspire both um, people locally and, and from around the world. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Zach Campbell. Oh, thanks. <laughs>
All right. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody, um, on, a, on a Wednesday and in the rain. It's kind of a theme for the summer. Uh, but my name is Zach Campbell. I'm the uh, founder of Friends of the Frame. I uh, was a little bit involved in the, the kind of last ditch effort that Samantha mentioned to uh, preserve this structure and space as, um, as something that could really become uh, one of the most vibrant and uh, celebrated spaces in Burlington. And so what I've been working on a lot this summer is, um, you know, the, this spot of the waterfront is open and accessible to the public, uh, I guess legally, uh, for the first time ever. And so, you know, that's an amazing thing to unlock uh, in terms of a resource for the people of Burlington, people that visit Burlington. And, you know, I, I think a strength of this, of this space has always been um, its open-endedness and it's sort of um, lending itself to creative thinking and big ideas and that was always something that worked super well here even when it was an abandoned building people were, were dreaming about things to do here and wanting to do things here um, and so I, I felt it was important to uh, not lose that spirit of this space and, and and certainly going forward not to lose that that spirit but kind of the flip side is uh, requiring someone or some entity to kind of uh, Take, take the lead with organizing and, and making things happen. And so that's what I've been trying to do a little bit. You know, certainly not alone. There have been many uh, amazing uh, people that have played important roles in, in starting to activate this space this summer. And you can see kind of a, a good breadth of that here with um, the movie nights that we did. Um, we had the uh, Vermont Skate Society and Joy Riders uh, start doing uh, completely on their own a, a, a weekly skate meet up here that uh, kind of fed into the, the great energy around movie nights. Uh, Lauren from, from Heart Song with uh, the hammocks that you see here was really just, you know, um, sort of this, this little group that started to form of, of people that um, were excited about the space and wanted things to happen and, and you know, it was, only, it was validating in a way to see so much of this happen um, organically. And so, um, that's what's been going on this year. You know, there's a lot of ideas I've heard, um, which is great and exciting. And uh, we'll we'll talk about some of the some of those common themes tonight. We'll of course hear from uh, hear from all of you as well. Uh, you can actually click to the next one. But one thing I do just want to leave everyone with as we continue the conversation is that. You know, this is an open-ended space. A lot of people come here and they're like, this is cool, but I don't really know what it is or what to do here. And, um, you know, the one challenge um, and opportunity is that um, it's a flexible space, but in order for it to be a, a functional flexible space, we really have to design for that flexibility and um, so that this park can, can serve people in the now, but also evolve and change over time as people want to do different kinds of things here. So I'll pass it off to uh, oh, Hillary. Oh, oh, do I have one more? Oh, OK. Yeah, so some of those, um, some of those potential uses um, you know, year-round is, is something I've heard a lot from people. <laughs> There's so much great stuff to do in the summer and the warmer months here in Burlington. But uh, as we all know, the reality of our climate is that it's cold half the time. So um, starting to move toward you know, how could this space be um, sort of a destination year-round? What could that look like? So um, some of the things we've, we've thrown out here, you can see them on the boards in the back. We have a dot sticker activity. People can, um, can put a sticker on, on what speaks to you. Or um, we've got sticky notes. If you have uh, another vision, please share that. Um, but here are some of the things that uh, we've heard and, and we're thinking about uh, that, that might be possible here. So now I'll turn it over to, to uh, Hillary and Matt from MBVA. Thanks, everyone. Hi, so you've already met Henry. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> He's had a troubled past. <laughs> um, so my name's Hillary Archer. Um, I am a landscape architect, a designer, and project manager at MBVA, which is Michael Van Valkenburg Associates. And um, I live in Brooklyn. We, our, our office is in Brooklyn. We do a lot of projects that are focused on public realm. We do a lot of projects that are focused on uh, equitable um, public engagement, 
and we've been pouring our hearts and souls into this first meeting and we're absolutely thrilled to see this room filled. So thank you all for being here today. This is valuable time away from your families and dinners, so um, thank you. Um, when I wasn't living in Brooklyn, though, I lived here in Burlington for about six years. Um, so I'm pinching myself, not only to be back in like my favorite place in the whole world, but to have this as a project. I mean, this is literally an, a landscape architect's dream. A <laughs> uh, lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities, a um, lot of collaboration. Um, and on that note, we have been so uh, fortunate to have this amazing client team with Samantha. Um, they put forth an RFP that was very well-rounded, and one of the things that was emphasized was that even though we were a regional team, we're not necessarily local, um, being from New York, that we work with local experts. Um, so we have added to our team these amazing local uh, architecture and landscape architecture and structural engineering and civil engineering uh, teams. So um, from SE Group, we have people in the room actually today. Um, Patrick, do you want to say hi? <laughs> Patrick uh, has a long, as, as all of these teams locally based, has a long history of working in the area. Um, so uh, we're very lucky to have his input and in thinking about this site. Um, from Freeman French Freeman, a local architecture firm, we have Alex. Say hello. <laughs> Same, same goes for him, he, uh, and lots of different projects in the area, even just on the bike path. Um, and then engineering ventures uh, for our site engineers and our structural engineers, because we are working with a frame. Uh, we have Paul here, <laughs> and Russell, hey Russell. <laughs> um, and then, because we are at this uh, juncture of taking all this amazing work that has happened, the history of the site, the history of the architecture, the specialness of the events and activation that are already happening on site uh, into a new, a new phase, a, an actual park project um, and a space for Burlington that puts it on the map as a waterfront destination regionally, but um, a neighborhood park as well. Um, and so to do that, we're working on a lot of different deliverables beyond just a park design. We're working on cost estimating to make sure that we're you know, understanding what our fundraising and and budget needs to work around and what's realistic, what's not. Phasing, project phasing, which is related to that. Um, and master planning. So how are we going to think holistically about this site, but also as it integrates into the waterfront, but, um, but everything beyond that. So to do that, we also have some uh, site electrical engineers, lighting designers, irrigation designers to make sure all of our plants are happy, uh, architects, uh, urban planning, and then our cost estimators. So that's our team. Our schedule, uh, quite simply, it's six months. It's a first design phase, a concept design phase, if you will. It's going to lead us into construction documentation. Um, and the main thing I want to make clear is that this is one of two main pu uh, public meetings that we're going to have uh, to include you all and also show you how the feedback that we've been getting from you all is actually having a place in the design that we're working on. Yeah. We've been doing a lot of uh, public engagement before this meeting, um, and we're going to share with you the results that we've been getting from that. This is an example of an actual just postcard that is all throughout the city in various places. Where are some of the locations? It's at the library, at all of our community centers, um, DPW, at City Hall. Yep. Yeah, and we're still working places. on places to put them so that uh, we can hear all voices. Um, but it's been great. It's been, it's been validating some of our initial thinking. Uh, about what could be appropriate for this amazing site. And this is the best mail that I get at the office. So <laughs> people keep keep sending your postcards, please. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, keep it coming. <laughs> um, but we get like really exciting ideas um, that that encourage us to think big. You know, like getting up into the frame, um, having these elevated views of the lake that you don't necessarily get along the waterfront. Um, so it's been it's been amazing, and as the next slide shows, 
surprising. Uh, we've gotten over four, as of today, over 400 yeah. responses um, to both our postcards and an online version um, on the websites. So um, the interesting thing that we've been learning are of all of the different possibilities that we could potentially weave into the site here, there are three like heavy hitters up here. Uh, views up high, as I just mentioned. Um, that seems to really be resonating. Um, concerts and performances, day and night, and then fun for all seasons. So we're going to talk about today, what does that really look like, and hopefully hear from you all um, what that looks like to you. Um, other, other things, other themes, if you will, these are direct quotes from some of the um, open-ended surveys that we did. Uh, a lot of emphasis on ecology, um, diversifying the plant palette here. There are some great uh, large existing trees around the site, but um, making more of a garden place here um, with ecological richness. Um, there's an emphasis on food, maybe cooking on the site, or just having access to concessions, temporary vendors, uh, or even a small, uh, perform uh, small permanent type uh, food uh, facility. Um, climbing, climbing up into different levels. We heard some activity was happening July 4th that will not be mentioned <laughs> <laughs> on the record. But um, that's, all, that's all interesting things that we listen to, we pay attention to, because um, you know, what, what is this frame? You know, it, what can it be to, the, to people and, and have memories here? So what are some other things? Yeah, OK, that, that's good. We'll, we'll, cut, we'll touch on some more as we keep going. But um, something I really want to make clear to everyone, uh, this isn't just a one-off meeting. Um, we listen to you all. And we, although we may not be able to get everybody's ideas <laughs> into a scheme, that's, a little, that's impossible, we do try um, to come back and show you how some of your ideas have landed in the physical form of the project. And the way that we do that is, well, literally showing you through presentation, but also um, we'll be having a physical model, like this one shown here, um, photorealistic experiential renderings um, to really kind of start to show what the experience will be like and hopefully convey that we've been listening, but also show you uh, why we've been hired to do this challenging project. <laughs> and then. I think just a repeat, this meeting will be happening in November. Um, so we'll have it posted. But also, if you sign in and put your email address, like you'll be on a mailing list to get alerted to any other activities and opportunities around the project. Yeah. So um, I will now hand it over to Matthew Urbanski, who's a partner at MBBA and someone I've been so lucky to work with and that I think is going to be the perfect fit for this project. If I can just embarrass him for one second. He is, uh, he is a genius at making world-class public parks. And I know that he loses sleep over projects like this one. And I know that he's very determined to make this a real big success for everyone. So Matt? Yeah. I <laughs> She doesn't like it when I mention she's the nicest person in the office. So she did, obviously. <laughs> OK, so here we are. And uh, looking down on it from this, I'm just going to reorient people, you know, because, you know, looking at it from the air here, for instance, just, and, and maybe answering a couple of questions about what are some of these things. So here, I'm just going to go around and just, just point out a couple of things to start out with. Here's the electric company over here. Here's a, a parking lot. Here's our our bike trail here as we're coming in. A lot of how you approach the site is from the south. Um, as, you, as you all uh, know, there's parking along here and then railroad tracks. <coughs> You're kind of coming in at this angle a lot. Up here is this great anchor of the skateboard park, which is just fantastic. And then we have the sailing center as well. We have a big opportunity and challenge of waterfront access here because you know it's this kind of post-industrial edge. It's kind of crumbling and sheet pile. And it's definitely not people friendly in terms of walking down into the water. There's this old sluice way here where the cooling water came out of the plant and would just kind of be brought in or took, uh, went out, let uh, cooling water out. So that's just sheet piles sitting there now. Um, and we have this nice new park, the waterfront park that's been made here. Um, but And then the frame, which is there, is this kind of wonderful sculpture. So um, 
just in terms of scale comparison, because this helps you kind of gauge, well, what can I do here? You know, can I have a football field here? No, you can't. Those are things. <laughs> but, uh, you know, City Hall Park, just under two acres, right? Um, the frame itself is a little bit under five acres, and then Oak Ledge, which we just went out to visit um, yesterday, is, is just over 40 acres. So that kind of gives you a sense of, you know, the kinds of things that you, you guys know about and you can do in those different spaces. Um, here we are right here, um, and it looks like, oh, I just go over there, right? I mean, we, and you guys know it's not true, really, right? There's actually a wonderful but and dramatic escarpment, um, right, that, cut, that, that, that holds the city up and, and gives it a great view, and certainly, you know, especially from the parks and things up here. But you got to go all the way around and down, and then and mostly up here. You can, you can come in down Depot Street, walk down Depot Street, not walk, not drive. But, but that's it, basically. You know, um, you can't just kind of get there quickly. So this kind of sense of how do you present? So the most important thing in designing almost any kind of space here, think about how much work people put into the front foyer, right? Or how, the, 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 the first thing you see in, in a park is very, very important, and um, how it's presented. So this is sort of that angle that we're going to be coming in on. So we're gonna, we want to think about how do we get how do we get there? Um, what do we see? Is well, how much do we see? You know, is one thing because one of the things you can use in landscape is a sense of anticipation, like you give a, get a bit of a clue about something, but you don't give the whole thing away necessarily. So there might be something like that. Um, this does that on a little bit of a small scale right now. It kind of creates a threshold. This, this is right off of the off the walk, uh, bikeway, as you guys know. And of course, this, this reminds us of the wonderful silhouetting against the sunset that we get here as we face west. Just to your left, as you're walking onto the site, is the, uh, the Verlinton Electric here, um, and these are, you know, these are um, occasionally used turbines to supplement with power. So they need, we need to be good neighbors um, and allow them to get and, and do what they need to do. But then we could also make it compatible with with whatever kind of public space we make as well. We've been starting to meet with them about that, and, and also with the water company. And so it's going to be. Uh, totally compatible, what we do here. Um, again, there's other infrastructural elements. There's a wetland that does actually filters uh, uh, rainwater uh, from the site. There's underground utilities, of course. And then you go and you see this thing. And, and to kind of artistic-minded people, maybe you're like, wow, that's so cool. This is wonderful sculpture. I don't need to do anything. I love it the way it is, right? But then there's other way, there's another thing that might come up, like one of the things that Hillary mentioned is, I think it's a little frustrating. You look at this and you're like, oh gosh, I sure wish I could climb up there. I wish it was you know, something I could just get up into, right? Some people have done that. I'm, I'm sure if I was in high school here, I would have been up in there already. Um, but uh, you know, it's, 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 in, it's enticing, but this thing just kind of draws you in as a space. Um, but it, it uh, but on a, on a, don't look at that. I'm very honest in my presentation. You know? but, you know, the other, the other thing I have to say though about it, because you know, there's probably mostly enthusiasts here, right? And we have part of making a public space is you really have to try to think about it from everybody's perspective, right? And um, and I was in a, in a in a car with a guy, a local guy was giving me a ride, and and we were talking to him about the frame, and he was like, "What's that?" And and, they, and we said, "Oh, that, it's that beautiful red sculpture that's down by the by the waterfront." He said, oh, they didn't finish tearing that down. <laughs> so, okay, so that was a, the guy was, by the way, this is the end of a long conversation. He was a very smart guy. He was like, he wasn't just on dope or whatever. And the thing is, to him, it has to have a it has to have a usefulness, right? It's not just gorgeous silhouette against the skylight, right? Like it needs to have some kind. Of, I mean, it doesn't need to be made into an office building, but it needs to have some kind of engagement, right, or usefulness. I think getting up into it, for instance, would start to answer that. But but I thought that was a kind of a little bit of a sobering like comment, you know, to get from man on the street. Uh, <laughs> they didn't quite finish their job. Anyway, um, this is great. This thing. 
think is fantastic to have here, and 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 you know, we just ran so. Oh, there's somebody um, already yeah, out there. Cleaning. You know, yeah. there's always somebody there, and th it's just the greatest thing for a park to always have people wanting to be in the space. That's what makes it feel safe. It makes it actually safe, and and so that is great to have it there. It also sets a kind of tenor in terms of activity and energy and useful and and all of that kind of thing. And but at the same time, just go back one slide for a second as we're going around. You know, it's a little bit of a kind of stark edge in between that and whatever is on. It's fine because the frame site isn't really developed yet uh, as anything. But um, you know, how can we start to bring the two together is what I start to think about as I look at that. These um, these trees along the uh, bikeway are beautiful. Um, so of course we want to keep that. And then we're over here. We're well, actually like right above this picture, was where Jack Jack's sitting. But what we're going to be wanting to think about is how do we how are we really compatible and beautiful with this function of the of the of the sailing center and, and, and you know just kind of seamlessly all works together. And even though there's different jurisdictions and invisible, you know, property lines, so to speak, you don't want that to be the experience of the site when you're on there, right? You want it to just kind of flow through and actually what you really want to think is like, you know, this was just natural, it just happened this way. Like, isn't the world wonderful? Um, so that's that's sort of what we go for. You know, as you move along the waterfront here, you get to this, which is very kind of dramatic looking, like you can make a nice painting of it, I think, but but it's 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 not, you know, friendly in terms of climbing. You could really hurt yourself, you know, get you know, get a, you know, cut yourself or something. And so how do we how do we, you know, get down into the water there? Are you trying to tell me to move? Yes. Okay. And then I I thought I was going to be too short. So um, here's another. So here's here's this, as the space kind of goes north from the from the frame. You know. Um, the, there's these great performances that we saw the various pictures that Zach showed of, of stuff happening here. But can we do something to this space that helps it kind of? Uh, join in with the neighbors better, with the shoreline better, and also facilitate the uses, especially as they focus down uh, south towards the frame in terms of like movie watching and, and other kinds of activities like that. So, you know, we walked around, we looked at everything, saw the opportunity, saw everything that's here, but then you say like, okay, how do we start um, you know, coming up with what, 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 what we should do here. And the great thing, you know, like Samantha alluded to, and this is very analogous to many of our best parks and spaces, is it's already been kind of taken over, not kind of, in a minute, but seriously, and, and people have invested their hearts and souls into this already. And so there's something you can, we can learn from. They've kind of done some of the work for us already, right? It's not like we're just making stuff out of whole cloth. You've kind of like done a lot of the work. And then what we can do is say, how can design, physical design, then start to support and enhance and make that stuff that's happening better? And is there like some newer kind of, can we push that stuff to a new, to a new, a new uh, space that, that is even beyond our imagination immediately? So, you know, the, the, the frame uses the Eiffel Tower theory, right? It basically leverages this kind of neat object to create a there there, right? And then people, and then and then you have things happening there, and you don't wonder where it is because it's right underneath that big red frame thing. So you get, the, and it's it's open and abstract, and kind of looks like a sculpture, like a found object sculpture. So it kind of alludes itself. It alludes to this artistic. You know, uh, open mind, open framed um, the experience that you can do all kinds of things in, which has been happening already. You know, and, and you can put a movie screen on it here. That last picture was an art show that was put into it and had projections within it. This, this one here is is where the movie screen goes. I'm sure you all know, but movie screen goes on the front, and then you can sit on the lawn. And this is what I mean by you know the lawn's a very flat, gets a little soggy actually. Could we shape it in a way that it drains better and also enhances views and things like that? You know, but it does it does create the setting that you know if you're going to choose some place to do this, why not do it down at the frame landscape? Like we saw some people just decided to picnic in front of it with a grill. Actually, I have a picture of them in here. 
So um, one of the things, you know, if you're thinking about artistic presentation and performance, can we, this is our project, so I'll illustrate some ideas with some of our projects, and I'll, I'll try to remember, but this is a, something we did in Austin, uh, recently opened in Austin, Texas, and, um, did, you know, they love bands there. And could we do this thing where we somehow build a, a stage? This thing acts as a stage, but then it's not a stage when it's not a stage, and it does, and it works that way, right? So could we build a stage into the frame in a way that, it, you know, it, it's there, but and then when you, somebody's on and using it, it really works well, and it kind of makes maybe makes seeing the, the performance easier or enhances it in some way or another. Um, and then. If you want to, if you want to get up into the frame, which I think is a kind of a given to us in a way, and certainly tell us, um, I, you, you can't just make it that only climbing ladders is the only way to get up there, right? You got to make it, you got to make it accessible to people in wheelchairs and other ways of getting up there that make it easy. I mean, not all the way up necessarily, but certainly in an elevated position. Um, so that's a very important thing to think about. I, I, um, and then could we bring some, use some elements to kind of rise, raise people up, connect to, you know, connect the ground plane up into the elevated planes, um, and then start to uh, think about how this could be like a viewing platform, stage, and, you know, to, and kind of space for performance of its own, right? And, and then, you know, how could these things kind of move through the landscape and, and, and facilitate that? And then if you make these elevated connections, this is our Bloomingdale Trail in Chicago, which is an elevated linear park. It's three miles long, actually. And they just kind of do things on it. You know, they make these, um, uh, uh, it's called this, they call it the 606, and there's a conservancy that um, does some of this kind of stuff where they're just having like a festival right on it. Because you kind of use, again, you're leveraging that, the, the kind of neatness of that structure. Uh, another thing we heard a lot about, I think, could really work well is is kind of pads and spots for concessions that you could plug in and make it a little less, you know, like what camping in the wild, right? Uh, make it work a little more seamlessly and easily, um, and you know maybe you you don't even have to you know plug in so you don't have to see the generators and you know all the little kinds of things that we could think about. This is, I, I love this, this is so, this is like the ecology of park programming, you know, uh, human ecology, right? It's like, here they come, look, they just, they just sprouted up on the site, it's fantastic. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're out, um, out here. Again, I think it's the theatricality of the space that might, I'm just, I don't know, you should tell us, <laughs> but it's sort of, I think it's the, you know, the, that there's movies going on already, the theatricality of it makes you want to go, you know, do this kind of thing. And also, a big paved space. <laughs> also, a paved space helps, yeah. <laughs> that does help. Smooth. Smooth, Smooth helps, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a group that we just saw um, yesterday. These, they just showed up. They're like, hey, I want to grill. They they chose this. So this is what I mean exactly. Like, they just chose this place. It's like it was a natural place to go set up and grill. And uh, and and that was kind of that's kind of fun, right? Well, who doesn't want to grill on the waterfront? It's sort of like kind of you know high style actually. So. Um, you know, if we could find ways to do that, it's you know it's a small site, but we could if we could work in ways to do that uh, or have food available, um, you know that's a great thing. Then, you know, one of the things that we love to do is go beyond your normal expectations in terms of the time they use the landscape, right? So first of all, nighttime use, like what's more beautiful in the summer? than nighttime use, right? It's cooler and you can really appreciate it. Um, uh, or um, winter, you know, can we get, they often, you know, often don't design landscapes for winter use, you know, they turn out to be sometimes used, but civic landscapes are not often. They focus on spring, summer, and fall, right? And can we plan in some kind of su a winter recreational fun that, picks up on this kind of skating energy of the skateboard park, but does it if for other people, like, you know, more nerdy people like me, you know, for instance, who could just skate in a more civilized way without cracking my head or open. Um, and then could, could something like that work 
as a way of skating in the summer too then, you know, so it's not just a winter thing, but it's a summer thing too. That's a question. Um, this is this is in a look, this is in a, a pier shed like a big shed structure that we made in in Brooklyn Bridge Park in in Brooklyn, and um, I'll just very quickly tell my nerd funny story about how I wanted to make this roller rink and we and 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 it, I just thought it was going to be so retro in '70s and like only I would get the joke and it turned out that like. They have like disco parties there, and I am absolutely not. I mean, like I'm way too not cool to go. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so I thought I was gonna. I thought it was gonna be just like uh, just this kind of cute um, nostalgic thing, but it's not. It's just so much a hit and brings you know the young adults and the, and, and people with, you know caring for little kids and everybody together. So it's very nice. Um, this is our skateboard park in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I just am showing this because can, this is a public path that's part of the park. So what we've done there is we've integrated planting and kind of visual access to the skating so it's not like just an isolated um, element so much. We've kind of integrated it more into the landscape that's totally doable here, some, some version of that. And then um, an idea that we, we somebody threw out there was, um, and then actually the water department head, yeah. she, she was like, hey, is there any water thing we could do on the side? And I was like, yeah, I might have an idea. Um, <laughs> you know, it's hot also in the summer here, you know, and could we do something that doesn't use a lot of water, but is cooling? And this is, this is actually called fog. This is, there's actually a waterfall that happens here also but this is our project in, in Oklahoma and we we're using this stuff uh, this uh, it's just water um, but it's run through a, a kind of very super micro um, nozzle that uh, turns it into, it looks like smoke or fog it's just very very magical or this kind of effect you know any kind of it's very I think it goes along also with the kind of artsy kind of environment as well by bringing in some slopes and um, shaping the land a little bit, we could enhance drainage. This is in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, we could enhance drainage and have it work functionally, but also we can create spaces for getting in the shade and also sitting and getting better views if you needed that, out either to the water or to, or to things that are going on on the frame. And it probably, there's bathrooms were probably number four on the list, right? I don't know. They were number three, but they were probably number four. You know, that's, that's needed, you know, public uh, restrooms um, and maybe some kind of kiosk to support that, um, any kind of utilities. And, you know, I don't know if there would be seasonal um, food or uh, permanent, you know, that, that's the kind of thing we could work out in detail, but a concession stand of some sort. Built-in seating is definitely a feedback that we've gotten, you know, it's just really not, there's the picnic, exact picnic tables that move around the site, um, but uh, there's not a lot of seating. Seating is a cheap way to make people happy, you know, in, in public landscape. So that built-in, this is built-in here, you know, imagine this is in our project in Hoboken, New Jersey, you're looking out over um, the water there. And, and then finally, and it is expensive, <laughs> but to get down to the water would be really great. This is built-in seating in Brooklyn Bridge Park, and then a kind of constructed engineered beach. Not really for swimming, more for just toe touching and touching, you know, getting to the edge in a safe way without, again, cracking your head on the rock or something like that. But, you know, this, this kind of setting would be really neat if we could do it. It's got a lot of challenges in terms of cost and permitting and things like that, but it'd be very not nice to try to work in something Thing that incorporated those activities. So, with that, um, I think we should. Yeah. I was getting like verbal, like communication with people. Like I was, you know, eye contact was good. So, um, uh, but I think, I mean, visual, not verbal. Um, but could we? Is this, I would love to. Yeah, I think we definitely want to open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vermont Skate Society to just kind of
kick off this discussion to talk about what has been happening on the site so far um, and ideas for Great idea. like I think these folks that are using the site now um, are our best um, folks to tell us like how can we enhance that and, and what's not working. I can hop up and say hey hey I'm Lauren Larkin I'm the most passionate person about the frame that you've met in Burlington <laughs> potentially. I am so proud of the work that's already happened because Samantha and Zach and this amazing to meet you Michael and Hillary. This has been a major thing. I'm just going to tell you a funny anecdote. I have a friend who's from Burlington. She worked, used to work at the Skinny Pancake. We wrote a song. She's the girl that quit the Skinny Pancake. Anyway, she's in Cirque du Soleil now. She's a hair hanger. She's representing New York for Cirque du Soleil in Las Vegas. But last summer, I had her down here. And I had already been working out like the insurance and engineering with engineering ventures. I got a little grant from Architecture Institute of America to buy some like mats and aerial supplies. And, and I was like, well, I'm gonna bring my Cirque du Soleil performer down here. We're gonna get some video, you know? But there was also cranes. <laughs> and so then I like convinced the site operator. I was like, I already have a certificate of insurance, like blah, 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 but just for 30 seconds, can we let her do her thing? And we've gone from that, from me like begging and pleading and being like, who, who can I ask? Like, how can we do this? To like, okay, we have permission. This summer we had movie nights. Um, one of the, the largest health problems that our city faces is like isolation and loneliness, lack of connection. So these different things that have been going on, I just really quick want to point out Julie Williams. Julie Williams runs um, Betty's Bikes. Oh. Betty's Bikes is a community bike shop, and they're going to have a structure in the frame next summer that's different than the one that's there now. It's like a little trailer right now that's cute, but she has one that's been perfectly designed for the frame. It's almost going to be like a little coffee shop bike shop. Mm -hmm. And every single time I come down to rig my big aerial hammocks that are big pieces of fabric or camping hammocks when it's wet weather, there's always someone down there getting their bike fixed. Like they just found it, like just what you're saying. And that's already starting to happen. People from um, Canada and other places that have come from movie nights, even the very first movie night, which was Jaws, and I work for ch I work for a children's theater in town too, so I have access to all these costumes. So I'm always like bringing down like shark costumes or like lots of flowers for Encanto. So anyway, long story short, what I'm saying is there's always people that just like find their way there and they like can't believe that it didn't exist before. So that's already going really well for me. I'm excited. I'm a singer and a songwriter, and I I also went to Brooklyn College for uh, performance and interactive media arts. I'm working on a public art project in New York called Bike Broadway, which is like, we'll talk. But like, <laughs> we're interested in like having people on bike rides, you know? And then like hopping in a hammock, and then like maybe having like a little something to eat, and like listening, maybe throwing on our roller skates. So there's just like these really fun ways as communities that I've seen people really have these healing experiences in the hammocks, and also the really cool swings that have gone up. We got a little bathroom, we got a little storage. Um, it's really like starting to come to life, and so, I just love that there's like a flexible vision and, um, and and so far so good you know we're like we're learning as we go so what I'm excited about is obviously going up I'm like working to buy a pulley and we're gonna go up we're gonna be like you're gonna be like oh, and then there's gonna be like someone singing you know and then um, and then also my personal aerial studio spaces around healing arts. It's currently at the Rail Yard Apothecary, which is set to probably be demolished. So I'm thinking about where can these aerial arts things take place? I'm partnered with Murmurations, who's the other aerial studio in town. There's about at least 100 people of all ages and sizes who love, that know already that they love playing in aerial hammocks, there's all kinds of really cool theater and modern dance things that are happening in Vermont. So I'm just excited to see as the season progresses and into next year, like just continue to experiment and see what's there and lift each other up. I'm actually a professional violinist, uh, but I also own those roller skates. I don't know. Um, yeah. Wow! <laughs> 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 
presentation. Uh, anyway, I am Joanna Velasquez Alpizar. I am a resident of the Old North End. This is my daughter, Sonia. And I am the founder of Vermont Skate Society. I'm here with our sister organization, Joyriders. Um, this is a BIPOC skate club. And I'm just so happy that I'm working with Alicia Taylor. Um, actually, I want to give her credit for finding this beautiful spot. We get to enjoy sunsets on the water while we're roller skating with our families. Um, Roller skating? Okay, you're like, oh, I'm too old to roller skate. <laughs> or I just want to die. Or I just, I, you know, I can't risk. I'm a violinist on skates. It's fine. Um, our youngest skater is three years old. Our eldest skater is 65. Um, I love that it's. It doesn't matter what walk of life that you're in. It doesn't matter where you came from, or does it, like it unites us. It really does, and. Um, we've been working really hard to bring the, the skaters of the state of Vermont together. So we've been doing weekly, I kid you not, I'm committed to this every week, uh, hosting a skate meetup, trying to find a safe space for us, which actually does not exist, except maybe with the pebbles that are over in that little paved area over there. Um, we host monthly roller discos. You're cool enough to come. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and we have been working really hard to make it accessible to everybody because we know that Burlington, there are people from various backgrounds um, financially. So literally, Alicia and I have been collecting roller skates from our own funds. To, uh, skates of various sizes so that we can lend them to people for no cost and also teach them how to skate. We've had donations from local motion for pads and helmets and things. This is something that we've been doing since April of 2022. Wow. And I'm not stopping anytime soon. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> it literally started with me asking coworkers, like, you want to learn how to skate? What size are you? You know, like, and then, okay, I'll come to you. We'll, I'll teach you how to skate. And now we have a following of almost a thousand people. You know, um, we have support from you know, Pigeon Skate Shop in Long Beach, California, which is where I'm from, um, and Dirty Deborah Harriet. You know her. She's one of the the best, actually, international skating instructors. Um, anyway, so we are really hoping to have a safe place to be. The bike path, pebbles, sticks, dogs, street crossings, not easy for this, you know? Uh, not easy for a beginner skater. She just now is, after a year of skating, is competent and feeling comfortable enough to cross those streets. Um, skate parks, that seems like it makes sense, right? Would you put this one into a skate park doing circles around people with skateboards? No, no. Eventually. I mean, she also is a park skater. She's, she's actually quite hardcore. But, um, but for a beginner skater, that is not a safe place to be. Not for, not for them and not for the skateboarders either. They're not, you know, a skateboarder, what if they ditch the board, but the board hits the beginner skater? Um, Okay, so why don't we go to uh, the streets again? Would you put a beginner in the streets? This is not a safe place for them. Um, or even the changes in elevation. Hills, not, not easy, right? So I, I don't know if you're actually aware, but we don't have a roller rink in the entire state of Rome. <gasps> The closest one in the United States is three hours away in Massachusetts. The closest internationally is in Quebec. Um, but again, does everybody have the means to travel and have, do a, a day trip or to take a weekend and go off to these various places just to go roller skating? No. <laughs> so we're really ho hoping that since we've already made it a hub here, that it could just Thank you so much.
Yes. Just, just, Great. just a quick question. You didn't mention the lighting at all that's already in place on the, on the plan, which I happen to love, but I wonder if you've gotten feedback about it one way or the other, positive, negative, whatever, because that's the one thing that you know, is quite striking as a nightscape yes. added to the waterfront park. Yeah, that's right. I think for people who have seen it, we hear positive feedback. I think not that many people have the opportunity to see it. And we've been thinking, as we think about having a park that's accessible into the evening and making sure it's safely lit, how do you maintain sort of that sort of more theatrical lighting on the frame and keep safe? So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you like it. And just do you have other ideas? Just wanting to make sure it stays. Is that your? Yes, I, I really like it. and. I, I have heard a little bit of negative stuff, okay. um, but um, but I happen to really love it, and I love how it changes, and I just love how um, it does add that vertical element to the waterscape. Awesome. Great you. point. Yes. Yeah, I love everything about your presentation. Uh, great stuff. One thing that Burlington's lacking, though, is that we used to have a nice youth music venue underneath Memorial Auditorium. Mm, yes. And the sailing center used to be in the building next to the electric building there. That would be a perfect place for a music center and then do the concerts here in this area. I, I think that getting, you can be loud there and there's no neighbors that are close. And uh, we, we're serving youth here, we're serving youth here, and serving musical youth here, I think would be a really brilliant way of integrating and, and getting the social aspects back that we've lost uh, through the pandemic. Thank you. I haven't heard that idea. I love it. Who else? Yes, James. I would like to have like a winter light show similar to what's at Shelburne Farms. OK. And I would think it would be neat to turn that frame into like a gingerbread house. All right. to want to bring roller skating to the waterfront. So just if you haven't signed yet and you want to add your name, you can. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yes. I love all the ideas around the way the artists are being brought in. And I, I noticed with last week or whatever, there was some blue fabric up on there. Yes. And I was imagining that earlier, but just as it was finished, having some moving fabric or even um, welders who put a little bit of curve up into the frame somewhere, welding some stuff or having art down below in the little in the little alcoves there. So um, anything we could do around bringing you know artists work. What was the story with the blue fabric? Um, there was a very violent thunderstorm <laughs> that came through the city of Burlington last Thursday that destroyed both our movie screen and um, the hanging of the arts. So this you know this summer is really about learning. We're learning you know when you put something up high in the frame and there's wind. It, it, Needs, you need to be thinking really seriously about how you're going to secure it. Zach, I don't know if you want to talk that about it. It's so, coming back. It's coming back <laughs> in a slightly altered <laughs> orientation, but it was most of it was salvaged and it is coming back. Hopefully, next week it'll be going out. Okay. Yes. Well, building on that, I just looked at this past weekend for the first time, and I've been here for like 50 some years. Okay. But, um, and uh, what you were saying about art and fabric, I thought of having something that would be like banners hanging mm -hmm. and banners of Burlington, but that it would change. I think one of the things that's really important about that space, don't have anything that's stagnant, especially for the people that live here, but have something that's dynamic. That's a great idea. Yeah. Who else? Yep. Um, I just want to reiterate, there was <laughs> um, reiterating just the mix, or sorry, the, the four season use and just how important it will be to have an additional winter space. I think that 
most people that are here year round would probably say that a lot of everything that we kind of do during the summer with farmers markets shuts down. Yeah. Um, and I also just like thinking about it being an outdoor space, but not just an outdoor space that's used strictly just for like market and capitalism, but also having market, an open winter space that is just for play and for fun and for embracing. So not feeling like you have to go to that winter space to buy something, yeah. which I think hinders a lot of people. That's a good, very good um, point. So that's just something. What like. kinds of things would you come to do here in the winter? To I mean, ice skating for sure. Ice skating. Um, I definitely love, you know, incorporating ice skating. And I also think just having like music and like sound walks and like light installations and just, yeah, I think the musical element, but doesn't necessarily mean that you're coming to a show. Maybe there's, you know, certain nights that there's music playing and you can come set up and there's heaters and you could have a picnic or, yeah. Awesome. I say I went to a winter light in music installation last winter. It was great. That's a great idea. Yeah. So something that I think about a lot is like this whole stretch of the, the waterfront bike path. There's not like a great use of it being like a pedestrian and cycling space and like a place to go to that's like a coffee shop or something like that. So like I think about how, um, not to like say like we need to like commercialize the bike path, right. but just yes. like there's almost like nothing to yeah. do other than ride and have like outdoor access. So like mm -hmm. having this be potentially with like the structures and kind of a more active space with people gathering to have it be like a place to go on the bike path that's not just like, oh, I'm going outside. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I think about a lot. So, so how, do we, how do we make it a destination to be this? You can go meet up with friends and grab a coffee or something in the, the afternoon and do something like that without being next to a road or like being in a parking lot or being downtown. Yeah. Great point. Yeah. Uh, I'm a student at UVM and I'm on the lacrosse team up there. Uh, I'm a sophomore. And I think it would be a really cool place that um, people could use it, like UVM could use it for banquets, uh, along with like Burlington High School. Mm -hmm. And then also the idea of um, the concerts and all that would get a lot of college students down here for sure. Um, which I don't know if everybody that lives in Burlington wants that. <laughs> um, we do. But, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I think that'd be a really cool place that like with food vendors and everything, it would definitely be a good Saturday spot for a bunch of kids to hang out and get food and get a break from uh, academics and everything. So it's great. Yes. Um, I know this will be expensive, but I think the top floor being um, an observation deck and the elevator or other one up the side of the building, take a glass of the elevator. Mm -hmm. Just looking on the top floor with probably a glass floor. Ooh. 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 Last floor. Kind of, kind of jumping off that. My name's Saul. I own Farms and Forgers Dockside, which is the outdoor restaurant with the food truck here at the Grand Tower Marina. It's on the other side of Frank. Yeah. Um, I think first and foremost, like making this a space that's open to the public year-round, that's free to come to, has all those sorts of things. I, we spent, my partner and I spent a couple of years pre-COVID working on a rooftop bar project. And I look at a blank frame there. <laughs> it's one of those, I don't even want to bring it there personally, but it, it seems like it could be an incredible space. And I've got two years worth of architectural drawing. So and, and it's, it's year round, um, you know, Are indoor. You offering free work? <laughs> something that you know I do think and then to have uh, a, a, a person paying taxes paying rent to help pay for the structure um, where we run into costs is where our issue and there's no rooftop bar in Burlington um, we were going to do a sustainable raw bar um, kind of apartment would not fish on a exciting sustainable see we don't need to go down that route either but but um, you know if you have something that's indoor that's 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 year round that um, where you run into the difficulties is building an elevator. You know, we were looking at buying, having to buy a building, which I certainly can't afford. Um, so if there was a private, you know, public partnership, okay. I think it is good and 100% and in keeping with, I know when the, when the marina was built, they contributed to the waterfront park that's nearby. Um, and so as a private business owner, I would certainly want to contribute to the the public space and, and finding that you know balance of well how do we get people up into it how do we make it so it's not just a free observation deck that the city's building a beautiful elevator for um, is there a way to you know something that we you know public the private business maybe can't afford up front but long term can help pay back and you know lock in 
a long-term, you know, sort of agreement. I, I think there, there are public uses and businesses. I don't think I'm the only one hearing artists and others who might want to get up into the space, um, not turning it into an office building, but I think it would be pretty, pretty vibrant, so. Yes, I love, I want to second that I love the lighting, um, but what I also love is the ethereal aesthetic of the frame. There was a lot of discussion, should the building totally come down, should we adapt and reuse it, and I think that this is an amazing compromise. But I love the fact that it's an ethereal frame. I would, I would find, I would love it to be a place of a sculpture park and some quiet as well, because we have concerts in Waterfront Park. We have ice skating up in Battery Park with a beautiful view. We do have other things that we could also make larger. But if we could also remember that some of us would like to walk in a quiet, quiet sculpture park so that not every day we're having a lot of things happening. So a balance of that, I suppose. Um, just, you know, there's a lot of energy, but quiet is nice too. Sculpture parks are nice too. Um, we do have very active other parks and music venues and things. So, you know, I'm just looking for balance in that um, because I come down here in the morning and it's not like, that's why, yeah. And you know, I just want to make sure that we don't go too far. Um, that you don't lose that ability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's landscaping, that's sculpture parks, that's, you know, right. calm spaces, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Very good point. Who else? Yep, in the back. Uh, I'd like to second some of the, a couple of the ideas uh, I would recommend translucent for. I think the restaurant idea, restaurant observation deck using an entire floor, possibly not the highest top, but that it was conveyors that brought the coal into the hopper. That eight foot floor right below the top yeah. would make, but a translucent floor would uh, give a little privacy to skirt wearing people. <laughs> and, uh, stargazing the, and, and some maybe retractable rain coverage for the restaurant uh, or the observation deck. Um, the band could be on the level, the first level of a band stand using the lawn as, as stage. The lawn could also be the, your winter ice break. That's what we do in Montpelier. Uh, we freeze some uh, temporary on, on the uh, state house lawn. Right. Um, a caution, some cautions. We are currently have real maintenance deficit. I do not want to move forward on this before we resolve the maintenance deficit. Our plaza, our fishing pier, our you know, our public restrooms, you know, our marina is in violation of their contract to provide hours of those public restrooms and nobody's doing anything about it. So we've got a hundred people camping just a quarter mile from here. They need showers, they need toilets, they need dignity, or it's gonna get worse. So we need an immediate plan for facilities. We need to remedy the maintenance thing before we embark upon a new exclusive and expensive uh, pursuit. Absolutely, yeah, thanks for sharing. Who else? Yes. Um, is environmental sensibility being taken into account, like with planting and water use and all those things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, MBBA, I think all of the work that you do like, is through that sustainability um, lens. We, and I think, as you can see, there's some existing plantings on the site that have taken that into account. There's a very, um, especially this year, very lush stormwater rain garden that has, has been designed both to you know help accept um, our stormwater, but with a lot of uh, native plant diversity. And if you come here um, early in the morning or in the evening, the number of bird, the bird activity in that um, wetland already by itself is staggering. I mean, you can just be here and listen, and it's amazing. So um, I don't know, Matthew, if you want to speak at all to how how you all take it. Sure. That. I mean, we were out, um, like, this is a very particular ecology, you know, and it doesn't look like a lot of ecology right now because it isn't. It's just post-industrial. But it, when we're, we were just walking up and down the edges of the lake and just seeing what wants to grow there, you know, for instance, the arborvitaes are, the native arborvitae tree is just loves to be right on the edge of the lake. I think it's just the moisture blowing in off of it. 
um, for instance, so that would be a good thing. There's a lot of other native trees that would look really great, but also bring a lot more richness to the site than it has right now. And it could frame it out and make it comfortable. And um, and then we could also could have the, the other functions that you're talking about, just to kind of uh, you know, managing of the, of the water and, and corrosion and all those, all those kinds of things. But and habitat, yeah. Oh, yeah, it would make a lot of habitat. Human habitat, too, but yeah. the, I think, yeah, it's, it's um, working with, working by empirical observation of what's growing in this kind of similar ecology all along here, so we'll start out with. Yes, Sophie's telling me it's time. There's two more minutes I want to, if someone has one last, question or thing they want to say, um, and then I'm going to let you say, but I just want to, um, the design team will be here if you want to come up and talk, or please, like, put your dots, like, let us know which of these activities would draw you, especially in the winter, what would make you um, come down here, um, please, or if you need to leave while we're sort of wrapping up, please do that on your way out and sign in with your email so we can keep in touch with you um, as we move forward. But yes, in the back. Um, I just be really happy to hear uh, that there's things already happening down at the frame and that it sounds like uh, people are very amenable to continuing those activities, whether it be roller skating, the bike shop, uh, artistic endeavors with people hanging up in the frame space, um, any of those things that are already there, because like I'm a big proponent of like, use what you've got to get what you need. Yes. What you got already is a community and a culture that's been built, building around the frame, and I think that's gonna be the heart of what pumps and drives energy into anything else that grows. So don't like tear the heart that's already grown out of the of what's there. Use it to expand upon. It.